Well, good morning. I hope you all are doing all right. Uh, JT, thanks for leading us in worship. Um, It's so good to be with you guys this morning. As JT mentioned already, my name is Josiah Presley. I'm the youth minister at Galloway Avenue Baptist Church, and I count it a great joy to be able to be with you and to open God's Word with you this morning. If you have your Bible, I'd invite you to open to Luke chapter 15. That's where we're going to be this morning, Luke chapter 15. This is the the fourth book of the New Testament, so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Uh, or third book, my bad. This is a third book in the New Testament, uh, chapter 15, obviously just coming right after chapter 14. Um, but that's where we're going to be this morning, Luke 15. We're giving you a very familiar text. Um, I want to thank John again just for inviting me out to be with you guys this morning. Uh, I know John and JT, and I didn't realize until this morning, but Robert as well. I know um, all three of them from Criswell, and um, I, I I love knowing them. They are They are good people, and I hope, uh, Robin Wood Baptist Church, I hope you know that you have, um, you have good leadership in these, uh, in these gentlemen who are out here. Um, John and I, we struggled through many courses together, and we've shared those. JT, I, I think he was working on masters, maybe, and so him and I didn't ever have any courses together. But um, it's, it's just so good to know them, and so I'm so glad to be a part of the ministry they're doing uh, here at Robinwood. So Luke chapter 15, that's where we're going to be this morning. If you've gotten there, you, you are probably very familiar with this text if you read the little um, headings you have in the text. So we see that there's a parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and then the parable of the prodigal son. We're really going to focus this morning Um, on verses 11 through 32 as we look at the parable of the prodigal son. This is a story that if we've been at church uh, for any amount of time, we're probably very familiar with this story. And this is actually one of my favorite parables. Um, It's one of my favorite parables because growing up, I think oftentimes I grew up as a kid in the church, and so oftentimes I thought, ah, the parable of the prodigal son, that's that's not one of Jesus' parables that has to do with me. Um, As a good church kid, that doesn't have to do with me. But really, this parable has so much, um, it has more so to do with the church than it really does the unchurched. And I I hope we'll unpack that this morning as we work through this text. Um, But before we begin, let's go ahead and uh, go to the Lord in prayer, why don't we? Lord, we thank you for today, God. I just thank you for everything you've done for us, Lord. I thank you, God, that we have the means to worship together. Lord, I thank you that um, a pandemic doesn't shut down your church, God. I thank you, Lord, that um, we are still able to gather together and we are able to worship together and we are able to open your word together. And as we uh, go through this time this morning, God, I pray that um, your people would hear um, the message you would have for them, Lord. I pray that your your people would be encouraged, your people would be built up, Lord, and that we would um, finish this time together this morning, God, better followers of you because of the time we have spent together around your word and singing your praises this morning. And so we give you this time. We pray you're honored by it. We pray that it brings you glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So Luke chapter 15, we're going to be in verses 11 through 32, but I think it's important for us to kind of understand what's happening right before um, we get to the parable of the prodigal son. Because here in chapter 15, we have three parables given, and they're all given at the same time, really kind of one right after another. They're, it's a set of three that go together. And so if we look at the very first verse of chapter 15, we get our setting for what's happening here with this parable. It says, Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all drawing near to him, talking about Jesus. It says, And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. And so we find this really interesting setup because we have Jesus, and if we look throughout all of Jesus' ministries, here's what we find. Jesus attracts all sorts of people. And in this case, he's attracting two completely opposite groups of people. He's attracting the tax collectors and the sinners. He's he's attracting those who society and Jewish culture are looking at and they hate. Why do they hate tax collectors? They hate tax collectors because tax collectors are literally traitors to the Jewish people. During this time, uh, Israel is occupied by Rome. And so for somebody to be a tax collector, here's what it means. It means these... um, these, these Jewish people, they have said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to collect taxes from my people 
to give to Rome, right? And to have been hired as a tax collector means that they are collecting from their own people to give money to the enemy. But not only that, the way the tax collectors make money is they come along and they, they look at what you have and say you have a sheep. And they say, okay, the taxes on your sheep are, are worth five coins or whatever, right? Five pieces of silver maybe. And they go, okay, so it's worth five. That's what Rome's going to expect for this sheep. But I've got to make a living somehow. So I'm going to tell them, you have to give me eight pieces of silver for this sheep, right? So tax collectors, they were seen as cheats. They were traitors. They were cheaters. Um, and then, of course, you've got sinners, people who are def- defying um, how God has called the people of Israel to live. So you've got these people, this group of people over here, right, um, that Israel dislikes. And then you've got on the other side of it, you've got the Pharisees and the scribes, right, these religious leaders of the day, these people who are, are these holy people who are, who are leading Israel back into how they're supposed to live as Israelite people so that they might receive the favor of God. And so you have these Pharisees and these Uh, tax collectors and these sinners, right? And so we have these two different parties, and we've got them all in the same place, which is something you wouldn't see um, in first century Israel during this time. But they're all in one place. Why are they all in one place? Because Jesus is there. Um, And the way this scene sets up, the tax collectors or the Pharisees and the scribes, they're grumbling. They are are mad at Jesus because this teacher, this uh, spiritual leader, what is he doing fellowshipping what is he doing receiving and eating with these sinners, these, these terrible people? And so Jesus then uh, responds to them with the following three parables. And so what's a parable? A parable, we can understand it simply as this. A parable is heavenly truths in earthly t- terms. It's a story that conveys heavenly truths in earthly terms. And so the first two parables we see is um, we see the parable of the lost sheep and we see the parable of the lost coins. And then we're going to see the parable of the prodigal son, but I think it should better be understood the parable of the lost sons. Um, And so the first two parables, they deal with Jesus talking about the shepherd and then this woman who, who go to great lengths to find that which is lost. The shepherd to find a sheep that which that was lost and the and the woman who goes to great lengths to find a coin that was lost. And so they lose these things, something is lost, they go and they search high and low, they find it, and then there's great celebration about the fact that they found what was lost. And these two parables at the very beginning, they stress the value of the lost person. That's what Jesus is doing. He's stressing the value of these tax collectors and these sinners to the Pharisee. But then the third parable, where we're going to spend all, the majority of our time this morning, is really directed at the Pharisees. And we'll see that as we work through the story. And so what I want us to do this morning, I want us to first just go through the parable. We're going to work through the parable to get the overall picture of what's happening. Okay? And then I want us to circle back around to the parable and look at the individual characters that we find in this parable. And then finally, we will look at how this parable impacts the text surrounding it as a whole. How does this parable, how does this story that conveys heavenly truths in earthly terms, how does this affect and impact what is happening here um, in the scene that we have just set in Luke chapter 15? So let's go ahead and let's begin in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32. And so I'm just going to read through the, pas- the passage, and I'll make comments along the way. It says, And he said, this is Jesus speaking, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. Okay, so first off, this is very uh, this is a very bold move by this younger son. This younger son, what he's doing here, he's basically looking at his father and saying, hey, hey, Dad, you know, when you die, there's an inheritance I'm going to get. Will you go ahead and basically be dead to me and just give me the inheritance that I would receive from you? Like, can you, can you imagine that in today's terms, right? If, if, you're, if you're a child watching this, could you imagine going to one of your living parents right now and saying, hey, Mom, Dad, you know how whenever you die, I'm getting an inheritance? Will you go ahead and be as if you're dead to me and just give me what's coming my way? Like, that's a bold move. That's that's a a very bold move. And and in first century Israel, you wouldn't wouldn't see that happening. At at this point, what you would typically see is if a son were to be so bold as to do that, the father would go, no, and actually get out of my house. 
Right? He would say no, and he would disown him. He'd throw him out. That is so disrespectful, this request that this son gives to his father. But what's even more surprising is the response that we see from the father, because it says in verse 11, or verse 12, and he divided his property between them. The father gives, him, gives the son his request. He divides the property. Not many days later, it says the younger son gathered all he had, this is verse 13, and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. This is actually where we get the, the title for this story, the story, the parable of the prodigal son. Because prodigal means to be reckless. Um, and so here we have the son who goes and squanders everything he has. He's reckless, right? So to be a prodigal is to be a squanderer, to be reckless. And here we see our prodigal son. Says, Father, basically be dead to me. Give me what's coming my way. And then leaves him to go pursue whatever he wants to pursue. And that's what he does. And he squanders it all. And it says um, in verse 14, And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. He had nothing. It says in verse 15, So he went and hired himself out, to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. Now we look at that and we, and we go gross, unless, unless you're like a farmer and you're like, oh no, it's just kind of part of life. You go and feed pigs, right? But like, I grew up in the city and I'm sitting here, I'm going, feeding pigs, like what? Like I have a, I have a friend who's a rancher and so he sends me uh, pictures all the time of like what he's doing out, um, you know, as a rancher. And it's like really crazy, really interesting, but really disgusting right? Um, the other day, he just sent me one of him, like, he had to help a cow give birth out in the open field, and he's got all this stuff all over him. I'm like, that's disgusting. No way I could do that, right? So feeding pigs, like, we can imagine that's gross. Like, we've seen pigs. We know, we know what that's like. Uh, we don't know what it's like, but, I mean, we know how nasty they are, right? But we consider this. This is a Jewish boy who's out here sent out to feel, feed pigs. This is like one of the most the most dirty, most demeaning jobs a Jewish boy could have, a Jewish man could be given, right? They, 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 don't, eat, they don't eat pigs. They're considered unclean animals. And, and he's supposed to go, and he's supposed to be feeding them. But it gets even worse than that. It says in verse 16, And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. So not only is he having to go and do this disgusting a uh, dishonorable job, but he is so hungry. He's, he's wishing that he could be fed by the very food that he's giving these pigs. But that's not where his story ends, because it says in verse 17, but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? He recognized that even, even those who just work for his father, not even those who are his father's children, they have more than enough. They have abundance. And he says, and I'm over here having pursued all these things, and I'm perishing with hunger. Verse 18, he says, I will arise and I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. So he comes to his senses and he realizes, hey, life for being just a servant, a worker for my father is better than life out here on my own. And maybe if I come and I repent and I come to him and I apologize to him, maybe he'll even let me become one of those hired servants. Not even a son again, but a hired servant. He realizes that being in any kind of relationship with the Father is so much greater than where he's at right now. And we see this true attitude of remorse for his sin, and we see repentance in him here. And so what does he do? He begins to make his journey home. Let's keep reading. It says, it says in verse 20, it says, And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion, and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and before you I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And he, he begins his whole spiel. He begins his whole apology, right? 
It says, But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand. A ring, a picture that he is part of the family. Right? This is, for him to wear a ring would be a statement to say that he is an heir to his father. Put a robe on him. Clothe him. Put shoes on his feet. Show that he has all the abundance and all the rights to the provisions of the father. He says, And bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate. And consider this. He's killing a whole calf for this son, right? Calves are pretty big. That's going to feed a lot of people. He's going to have a huge party here for this son. He says, let us eat and celebrate. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He says, and they began to celebrate. So consider this. The son who has brought so much shame to his father. He is coming home in repentance. And what do we see about this father? We see first, we see this father see his son from a distance and come running to him. And we see the father disgrace himself by running to his son. In this culture, men did not run, Right? It was very undignified to run. And, and consider this, like, we're sitting here, you know, and all the guys in this room, we're wearing pants or shorts or whatever, right? We could run, no problem. But during this time, we're talking about guys wearing tunics and robes. Like, I mean, this is like they're wearing, like, dresses practically, right? And so for a Jewish man to have to pick up his robes and go running, that would be unheard of. That would be undignified. But not only would that be undignified, he goes running to a son who in just a handful of verses before said, Dad, I want you to be considered dead to me. I want you to give me what's coming my way. Not only is he undignifying himself by running, but he is running to one who has rejected him and brought so much disgrace to his name already. And yet, he gets to him, he embraces him, he brings him right back in. And what does he do? He doesn't say, like, hey, this is, you know, my weird son, Bill, over here, who, like, did all these terrible things, who's come home, and so we're going to, like, come put him in, like, this basement room, kind of away from everybody and take care of him. But he says, no, we're going to have a celebration. Kill the fattened calf. Bring everybody in the community around to celebrate the fact that he has come home. And again... The story doesn't end there, though. It says in verse 25, Now his older son was in the field, and he came and drew near to the house. Right? Remember, there's two sons in the story. It says, And he heard the music and dancing. Right? So older son's out working, being the faithful, good model son. Right? And he's getting near the house, and he's hearing music and dancing. He's like, what is going on here? Right? And he shows up, and he called one of the servants, verse 26, and asked what these things meant. It says in verse 27, And the servant said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. And do we see the older brother goes, Yes, you know, Bill's back. How great, how awesome. He's home. No, that's not what we see. We see in verse 28, it says, But he was angry and refused to go in. Okay, now this, this again, this actually, this moment, we find the older brother now is bringing disgrace to his father. Because his father's having a great big celebration for all the community, but the older brother won't come in. It says this, And his father came out and entreated him, begged with him, pleaded with him. And so now the father again is shaming himself by he is leaving the party that he is hosting. He's hosting a whole party for everyone, and now he is leaving it to pursue his other son. He came out and entreated him, verse 29, he says, But he answered his father, the older brother, Look, these many years I've served you, or I've slaved for you, some translations might say. And I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your property with prostitutes, you killed the fattened calf for him. He says, I've been so faithful to you. I've done everything you've told me to do. I've slaved for you. I've served you. And you've never let me celebrate in this way. He says in 31, the father answers him. He said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that is mine is yours. In this case, literally, remember? When he split the property to give the younger son, that means the older son knew what was coming his way. Right? He says, verse 32, It was fitting to celebrate and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. And here's what we find in this parable. Unlike the other two parables, 
this one is left somewhat unresolved. Consider the other ones, the, the lost sheep, the sheep is found, celebration ensues. Consider the lost coin, the coin is found, celebration ensues. Consider the parable of the prodigal son, the lost son is found, celebration ensues. But the story doesn't end there because now the focus turns towards the older brother. And it's actually left unresolved because the older brother is left outside of the party with the father begging him to come in. And the question is left, what is the older son going to do? How is the older son going to respond? This story is left unresolved, but I think we'll get to um, how this story ought to resolve um, here in a few moments. But let's go back through now, though, and let's take a closer look at each of the characters in this story. Let's first consider the younger brother. The younger brother, he only wanted the benefits of the father, but not the actual relationship with the father. The younger brother preyed upon the fact that he had a loving father. He knew if he went and he asked his father for these things, that his father would give them to him because his father is a loving father. The younger brother, he pursues everything he wants, but is left empty. He gets everything he wants, but is still left wanting. He pursues the desires he has, but ends up with nothing. The younger brother, we see that his choices take him farther than he wanted to go. He, they take him to the point of he is working for a pig farmer. They take him to the point where he is desiring to be fed with the same things that are fed to pigs. But here's what else we see about the younger brother. We see that when he comes to the end of himself, he realizes how good being in a relationship with the father is. The younger brother has a right understanding of the damage he has done. He, he recognizes he doesn't deserve to be called the father's son. We also see this, though, that the younger brother, upon reten- repentance, upon turning from the actions and the ways and the lifestyle he's in, turning back towards the father, in that process, this younger brother actually thinks he must somehow earn back his father's acceptance. Maybe I can just work for him to pay it off. The younger brother, they're easy to find. They're the ones that we here at church, we, we say, can you believe he walked away from the church that way? The younger brother, they're the ones that we say, can you believe the poor choices they're making? The younger brother thinks that whatever they're running after will bring satisfaction. And I'd ask you this question this morning. Are, are you that younger brother right now? Are you running from God after anything that will satisfy? Are you pursuing all these different things, whatever it may be at this point in life, other than God, that you think are going to satisfy you? Whether it be the job, whether it be the money, whether it be whatever it may be. This guy, he, he just fulfills all the indulgences of his flesh. But what are the things you're running after right now? You're pursuing after? Are you that younger brother? Next, let's take a look at the second character in this story. The older brother. At first appearance, he is, he is our model child. Faithful to the father. Serves. 